Today, uh, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to cover only uh, 13 verses this morning. Not a lot of verses, but there is a lot in those verses. Uh, Paul has a lot of meat for us uh, this morning. If you were here last week, we were talking about um, how the Corinthians had a certain problem, at least the mature believers in the church of Corinth with the younger believers. Paul uses the word weak, not to refer to them as a inferior, but that they were uh, younger in the faith. Their, their faith wasn't that firm. And there was this, this problem, this specific problem about meat that was sacrificed to idols. The meat was cheaper and it was sold in the, in the temple. It was sort of like a deli as well. When they weren't sacrificing uh, animals to their false gods, they were selling the, the leftover meat. I mentioned how part of the meat uh, was burned up in, in the burned uh, sacrifice, but the other part was given to the priest. The rest of the meat was sold in the meat market and it was cheaper, so people partook of it, including Christians. So you, back then, if you were at a potluck or some sort of a church event, you most likely could have eaten meat that was sacrificed to idols, and that was a problem back then. Should Christians eat meat that was sacrificed to idols uh, in order not to stumble a younger believer? Or should they just take advantage of their liberties, and who cares what this other person thinks? I'm free in Christ to do whatever I want. Was that what Paul was, was trying to enforce? Well, what was Paul's deal? And we sort of talked a little bit about that. How Paul says, hey guys, don't, put your, don't allow the liberties that you have in Christ to stumble a younger believer. Don't allow the fact that you know that these, the, the, these, uh, this meat in itself is really not uh, uh, infected by, by it being offered to idols. But don't un allow your knowledge that there are no real idols. Uh, idols, that the idol in itself is just molded clay. Don't allow that to get in the way of a younger believer's growth. Don't stumble somebody based on your knowledge. Don't allow having a big head stop you from having a bigger heart towards your, uh, the younger uh, brethren. And his main point right there was not about uh, uh, private information, but corporate transformation. That's what the whole church is about, right? They're going to know us by our love towards each other, and Paul was emphasizing that. He showed the example. He showed several examples in chapter 9 of how he put aside his liberty for the church. He says, look, guys, I have the, the right to be supported for my ministry. And he gave several examples. He talked about the law. He talked about how Jesus says, you know, the, the minister of the gospel should be supported by that, by preaching the gospel and so on. And he says, hey, guys, the apostles, Peter including, Peter there, he, he has the right to have a wife. He has the right to be supported by the church, which he was. But he says, I have that right as well. But he chose not to have the obligation of a wife. He chose not to uh, put that obligation on the church to be supported by the church. And he made that exception, but he was trying to show them, look, this is where you can put your liberty aside. This is the example that I'm showing you. I'm not just preaching something, I'm practicing it. And then he gave a, a bigger example in regards to evangelism. He says, look, when I'm around the Jews, when I'm around those that are under the law, I behave as under the law so he can reach those that are under the law. When I'm around those that are not under the law, the, the Gentiles, I, I, I am as a Gentile, not under the law, but still under Christ. And what he meant by that is that he, he didn't compromise his beliefs or started, well, because my friend over here, my unbelieving friend, you know, drinks, I'm going to follow him to the bar and I'm going to witness to him while we're both drinking Budweiser. That's not what Paul was saying. He, he says, but we're, I'm still under Christ, right? You've got to have that, that godly wisdom there. Don't compromise your beliefs because you're, quote, unquote, evangelizing. Um, so Paul makes that example. He puts aside his, 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 uh, his uh, uh, dogmas. He puts aside his uh, private beliefs to reach more. He wasn't trying to build walls with people. He was trying to build bridges, and that's what the gospel is about. That's what uh, uh, the Great Commission is about, and that's what Paul was, was uh, uh, demonstrating here. And then he ends chapter 9 by giving us a pretty interesting picture of the Olympics, basically, uh, of a runner, or, or even uh, the word can be translated wrestler, somebody that was involved in Olympics, uh, how, he, uh, how we are all involved in the race, how we're all involved in this competition, not against the uh, uh, ourselves. I'm not competing against Joseph. I'm not competing against uh, uh, Joshua over there. We're not competing against each other. We, we're, we're competing for to serve the Lord. We're, the only person, the only obstacle within ourselves is, is ourselves. And, and um, the obstacles in themselves can be uh, doubt, can be any problem, spiritual warfare, whatever. Now, are you going to let those things get in the way of pursuing Christ? And Paul's emphasis was like, look, everybody's in the race, but some of us are acting as like we're referees, right? We're, we're, we're judging others. We're, we're, we're uh, on the bench. We, we've, we've called it quits and whatnot. But Paul says everybody's in the race. You guys are in the race, and you guys should be in the race to, to win it. We should be in it to win it, to win the prize, he says. So he finishes that in chapter 9. 
And then he starts off this next chapter, which we're going to cover right now, uh, which I titled typo. And I titled it typo because it, it's a very interesting word. It means w what it means, right? It means typo is a typo. It's a, a typographical error. Uh, you know, you can do a typo when you misspell a word uh, either by pen or, or on your uh, keyboard or whatnot. We make typos. Ty a typo is an error. Well, the word for the word example we're going to look at here, the word the Greek word for example that Paul is going to give us here is the word uh, typos, okay, which we get our word type for, and he's going to give them examples or typos or these errors that different uh, saints of the Old Testament committed, so we can learn from their typos, okay, so we can learn from their mistakes in the past. Uh, I think Charles Spurgeon once said, you know. Uh, the fool learns from his own mistakes, but the wise man learns from the mistakes of others. And Paul is trying to push that here. He's trying to show them the, the mistakes of, of, of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness so they can learn. So they, stop, so they would stop having this attitude of entitlement. You know, if you have an attitude of entitlement, you know, give it to the Lord. Get rid of it because that does not portray Christ Jesus at all. That is the opposite of, of what Jesus came to show us. He humbled himself to the greatest point. There were some things about the Corinthians that uh, caused them to be entitled. There was, they were a pretty blessed church. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 7. And, and if, this is good because if you weren't here with us during this time when we began this series, Paul doesn't start off by bashing them. He doesn't start off by saying, uh, by uh, outlining all their wrongs. He starts off by, by praising God for them. And this shows us that they were a very privileged church. Notice what it says here in verse 4. Paul says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in, every, in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there were some good things that the, the, the church of Corinth was practicing and they did have. They did have an abundance of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were exercising them. The problem was, as we're going to read about in the later chapters, is that they weren't exercising love. They had the motions, but they didn't have the, the love, the feel that, that is supposed to be used. Later on, Paul talks about that, how, you know, you, you can have uh, the gift of prophecy, but without love, it doesn't matter. What are other things that these uh, Corinthians practice well they practice sexual immorality they committed idolatry they, they were fighting and suing each other within the church and outside of the church um, there were some that were committing a uh, drunkenness in the church at the uh, communion feast uh, others were abusing the gifts of the spirit some were compl a lot were complaining and murmuring there was church uh, uh, splits and they were challenging the authority of Paul as, as we saw last week as well all these things were going on in the church and I think today as well, they're pretty prevalent. I mean, they happen in every church. No church is exempt from, from these things happening. So this is good. This is good application for us today. So we can examine ourselves. Remember, the application that you get here this morning is for you specifically. So if you're here and you're thinking, well, this is, this is for my neighbor here. This is for my wife, you know, and you're elbowing somebody. You know, First apply it to yourself, right? First apply it to yourself and don't say, well, so-and-so should have been here today. No, because the word I preach is not just for you, but it's, it's for me as well. We all got to examine ourselves to see if we're in the... In the faith. So, so let's go ahead and bow our heads in a word of prayer before we begin this message. Dear Lord, Father, we thank you again for this time, Lord. We thank you for each and every, uh, every time and every hour that you are with us, Lord. Father, don't, don't allow us to neglect your presence, Lord. Help us to acknowledge that, that you are here like Jacob, Lord, when he was in, in Bethel, Lord, where, where he says, he, wo he woke up and he says, Lord, uh, he says, the Lord was here all this time and I did not know it, Lord. Lord, you are here. Your presence is here. Help us to acknowledge that. Help us to acknowledge that you are here, that you want to speak to us through your word, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray for the children's ministry and for the youth. We pray for their protection, Lord. We pray for our protection as well. We pray that uh, you would not allow the enemy or any thought to enter into our minds now that we would... Uh, Lord, be focused on what you have for us this morning and concentrated, Lord. If the caffeine is uh, wearing off, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would wake us up to what you have for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin here. I outline this message into three parts. First, we're going to look at verses 1 to 4. We're going to look at the privileges of the Israelites that were in the wilderness. They had certain privileges, and I think a lot of benefits that we today don't necessarily have in the same, well, at least not in the same uh, degree as they did. 
you'll see what I'm talking about as we read these first verses. Now, I want you to notice as well the word, the repetition of the word all, is how many times it's used. Look at what it says in verse 1. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fo fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, I think the reason Paul uses, emphasizes the word all here is because he was trying to show the Corinthians that all the Israelites that were taken out at, at, during the Exodus, that were taken out of Egypt from the hands of Pharaoh, from the oppression of slavery there, they were all blessed. They were all covered by God, and they were all privileged. They were all experiencing these things in their lives. Because in a little bit, he's going to move from all to most, and then from most to to some and he has a purpose for that but let's cover these verses first he says right off the bat I don't want you to be unaware I don't want you to be ignorant of this thing that I'm, gonna, I'm about to tell you so if you're ever thinking you know uh, um, if, you're, if you're thinking of, I should, probably should have missed church today I'm glad you didn't miss church today because Paul has something for you that he doesn't want you to be unaware of he mentions that all the fathers were under the cloud what cloud well see by day there was a cloud that would guide it was like a like a divine GPS system, the the, the cloud that these uh, the Israelites were follow the cloud by cloud by day, by day and during the night they would follow the pillar of fire. Yeah, Exodus thirteen twenty one says that it says the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud of cloud. Notice it was the Lord. It was a theophany here. He says to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. This is pretty interesting because today I mean this is awesome this is like a divine gps system because today we 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 pray we're like lord do you want me to move out of yuma do you want me to move out of the desert maybe go to san diego or or leave my job and, and work over here Why we have all these questions and of, of, of direction all the time a lot of prayers are, are geared towards direction are geared toward what i should do well back then it was pretty easy if you wanted to move somewhere and you didn't know well just follow the cloud right just follow the cloud. If, if the cloud is over there, you go that way. Make sure you're under the, the cloud, under the shade. So this cloud wasn't just a, you know, a, a method of shade, a method to guard them from, from the sun, but a directional system, and not just by day, but by night. What else do we see here? In Exodus chapter 14, 21, it, um, Moses gives us a little bit more of, of the story there of how when they initially were... Uh, escape from Egypt when they left Egypt how Pharaoh thought he had he had them cornered there at the Red Sea the, the you know right off the get-go the the uh, Israelites were complaining and they were grumbling like Lord did you bring us out to just to kill us out in the desert did you bring us out of Egypt just to kill us over here and, and they, they complain all throughout you know most of the 40 years there from the beginning close to the end there and um, and we see that Pharaoh gets there he thinks he has him but what happens the Lord parts the Red Sea. We see that in Exodus chapter 14, verse 21. It says, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind, and all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters, uh, the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And this is how I imagine it. It's sort of like the first aquarium because you're walking and you got like this wall of water here. The, you know, the jaws can't get to you. It's like a wall of water there, but you probably can see the, the sharks and all kinds of marine animals. And then they're walking through there. And notice that's not the only, the only miracle. God hardened the, the soil there so they wouldn't sink or, or get stuck. But what happens after that? You know, after they cross over safely, then, uh, you know, Pharaoh's uh, chariot and his army is, is drowned up by this, you know, this immense body of water and you know there's been discoveries of, of, of chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea to this day and just just verifying what the Bible has already told us you know thousands of years before and we see you know in the Bible Moses is a type of uh, he's a type of the law but he's also a type of a, of a redeemer in the sense that he was a mediator there that God spoke through Moses and he led his people God was the conduit in a sense of, of, of the miracles of God God used Moses to part the Red Sea and you know um, provide for for his people and he's a picture of that so you keep that in mind as we continue reading uh, of of moses and, and of the israelites and all their their complaints 
But what else do, do we read in these first verses? It says that they were baptized into Moses. What does that mean? Did Moses literally baptize each and every Israelite? Um, some speculate there was over 2 million Israelites there. I, I don't know exactly how many. I don't think any scholar can tell you an exact number, but there was a lot of Israelites. Did Moses baptize each and every one of them? No, uh, he didn't. What, what Moses is trying to tell us here, what, um, what da Paul is trying to tell us here is that to be baptized is to be submerged under something, to be under someone as well. When we are baptized in Christ Jesus, water baptism, for example, you know, it's symbolic of going, you know, dying with Christ and resurrecting with him again to newness of life. You know, we're going under the water, we're being submerged. That's what baptism literally means. But also, it, we're not just identifying with that, but we're identifying with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So for the Israelites to be baptized into Moses, it meant that they, they understood that Moses was the leader there. They were under his uh, uh, teaching, under his leadership. And that's what, what Paul is trying to tell us here when he says they were baptized into Moses. But God wasn't just their directional system. He was also their providence. It says that they drank a spiritual, uh, a spiritual drink, and they also had spiritual food. What was the spiritual food? What was manna from the sky, this heavenly food? We don't know exactly what it was. I think Skip Heitzig said it was, it, he compared it to um, uh, glazed donuts, Krispy Kreme donuts. And I, I, I'm guessing it, it was sweet. I'm guessing it, it was sweet, but we, we don't, I don't think we have this heavenly food anymore. But the point is that Christ, Christ is the living bread, he tells us in, in the Gospel of John. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That's pretty interesting because after Jesus said that, uh, before he said that, he had fed the 5,000, the over 5,000, by the way. He had fed them. The next day, they wanted a continental breakfast from Jesus, and he's like, hold up. Let me tell you something, uh, some spiritual truth here. He says, I am the bread of life. A lot of them left after that because they were just there for, for their bellies, not for their hearts, not for their, their souls. But this is an interesting thing here in verse 4. It says that that spiritual rock that followed them was Christ. The rock was Christ. That's pretty interesting. Because, see, here it's sort of like a deity statement when it talks about Jesus Christ being the rock. In the Old Testament, when we, when we hear about God being a rock, it says, you know, Jehovah's a rock or Yahweh's a rock. It's no contradiction in the New Testament when we read about the rock being Christ because Jesus is God. Jesus is God, and it's just clarifying that. Some Jewish commentators say that the rock actually literally followed them, kind of like a rolling stone, or maybe like, um, like Wiley Coyote when, when he's trying to get the, the, the roadrunner. He's hiding under the rock, and the rock is moving. Now, I don't know how it was, but it's not, uh, it's not out of the realms of possibilities because think about it. The parting of the Red Sea was not something natural. It was supernatural. The, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire, all that was supernatural. Why not? Why couldn't it be a rock that was following them? To me, it's not a problem. Some say, um, some scholars say that it was not the rock itself that was following, but the, the rivers of water that came from the rock that followed them as, as a stream. Whatever the case, the Lord was there. He was providing for his people. That, that's what Paul is trying to tell us here. Hey, everyone was privileged here. God was providing for each and every person. He was their daily bread. And today, you know, our daily bread is, bread is the word of God. Back then, the, the Israelites, they wanted to store up the manna. You guys remember that story? They wanted to store up the manna for themselves, you know, make sure they had some saved up for the next day. But what happened to the manna? Turned into to worms, more specifically maggots. So you wouldn't store up manna unless you were going to go fishing the next day and you needed some bait. The, the, these guys, you know, it, it's spoiled. And, and what God was trying to do here is to cause them to be dependent on him. That is a, a big theme in the Bible. God wants you to be fully dependent on him for your daily bread. And he shows us that through the wilderness experience. He wants us to be dependent on him. God's word is our daily bread. We need it. And it's interesting because today as Christians, unfortunately, sadly, it's not that we want to store up the word of God. It's that we can go without the word of God. You know, we're fasting from, we fast from the word of God instead of fasting from, from other things so we can partake more of, of his word. And God's word is like the pillar of fire, you know, because it's, it's, it's a light onto our feet. It helps us, you know, walk through the darkness because this world is pretty dark. The, 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 the closer we get to the, I mean, we're in the last, da last, last days of the end of days here. And, and the darker it gets, the more we can, the more we need God's word to survive. It is, a, it is our daily bread. It is our, our water as well. It is, it is our sustenance. What other things do we see here? Some similarities between the, the children of Israel and the church today. For example, like them, we were delivered. We were delivered from the hands of oppression. 
we were, um, God took us out. He, he transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We are uh, citizens of, some, of heaven now, even though our, our, our spirits are not there with them at this time. We are saved. We are born again. So like them, that they were delivered from Egypt, which is the type of the world, we also were delivered from the hands of, of Satan, from the world. In that sense, the church is also guided through godly leadership. God uses pastors and teachers and preachers and so on to guide the flock. Uh, but again, Jesus is the, the, the head. Jesus is still uh, the church's sustenance. God's word is the sustenance here. We're all he headed to the promised land, just like them. They, they were looking forward to that Jericho there, to the promised land. We are also looking forward to heaven, okay? I mean, I am. I mean, the, 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 the older we get here, the more we see the, the consequences of gravity in our lives. You guys are, that are older, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you guys that are younger, you're going to get there as well. The Lord tarries. So, you know, the, more, the older we get, the more our friends go to be in heaven, the more we, wanna, we long for heaven. The more heaven is, doesn't just, is not just a, a destination, but a motivation to, to get there. And, and that was the, the, the land of promise for us, at least. That's land of promise. But like them, here's Paul's point. Just like them, just like they sinned and they grumbled and, and, and committed idolatry and all these things against God, and they had their consequences, just like them, we, us, even though we're under grace, we still have the, the, the consequences there. See, if I, if I choose to sin, if I choose to sow to the wind, I'm going to reap the whirlwind. Paul says that. Not, not Moses in the law, but Paul under, in the New Testament. So we must be careful that we not reap what we sow, that we sow to the Spirit and not to the flesh, Paul says. So saying that, now let's look at verses 5 to, to 11. Notice how he said that all, all were privileged and all came out, all were under the cloud. Well, now he says, most. With most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, that's an understatement, because most means basically 99.9% .9 of them, because only two people of the original ones that came out of Egypt crossed over into the Promised Land. Okay? Joshua and Caleb were the ones that crossed over. Moses couldn't cross over. The Lord told Moses to speak to the rock. You remember that? He told him, speak to the rock so he can, the water can come out. But he hit the rock, and then he rebuked the Israelites, and he took, he took a little bit of credit for the water coming out. He disobeyed God. Water came out of the rock, but Moses did not come out of the, the wilderness because of that. And, and the Lord shows us that, hey, you know, they, they suffer the consequences for their sins. The second generation crossed over. The younger Israelites did cross over into the promised land with Joshua and Caleb, though. So it's sort of an understatement in verse 5 that they were scattered there in the, in the wilderness. Look at verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust. Let's see if you can count all these sins. That we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The word play here doesn't mean that they were, you know, playing hopscotch out there or... or, or trivial games, but they, they were, it was sex games, it was sex orgies that were happening here. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents, nor complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition or warning upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So I don't know about you, but I counted about five sins. Let's see if I got them all right. Let's see if you got them. Uh, lust, idolatry, immorality, testing God, and complaining. If you got a newer translation, maybe those words might, might, you might have some synonyms of the same sins here. So let's break these down. Let's look at these individually. Verse 6 talks about lust. He says that, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. That word lust here is pretty interesting in the Greek. It means to set the heart upon. The word picture that Paul is trying to show us is that, you know, if I lust, uh, if I'm lusting against the speaker over here, and this is my heart, well, I'm setting my heart upon the, this speaker. And it's interesting because it says that, that their bodies were scattered in the wilderness, and that tells us that, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness because their hearts were left in Egypt. They always complained, oh, we had it better in Egypt. It was better back then. And lust will do that to you. Sin will do that to you. It will remind you of the, the 
temporary fun times of when you were sin when you were sinning or when you were doing something the bible does not deny that yeah sin is fun for a little bit but then comes the consequences it says so lust will do that to you it will it, it will not mention or remind you of the consequences of your sin but it it'll make you think oh well i kind of you know when i wasn't so restricted I, I had it better you know when i wasn't restrained to one man i had it better when i wasn't restrained to my job or i had it Whatever thing you want to add in there. You know, when I used to be able to drink and get high and do this, I had it better. But, but you forget the consequences. You forget. Lust will not mention uh, it, the emptiness, the, the trouble with the law, the, the trouble with, uh, with, with the rest of the things that came about. And that's what lust does for you. It, it, it's sort of a, a constant longing and desire and passion for something that is unlawful, that is wrong. And you might ask yourself, well, what am I going to do? These are temptations that I have, Albert. Well, if lust means, if the word lust here means to set your heart on something that, that is unlawful, well, well, take your heart and, and set it on Christ, you know? Take your heart and set it on his word. Set, set your heart on, on godly things. The Bible says, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, you know, set your heart on, on heavenly things. You know, look up. Set your heart on, on, on the Bible, on God's truth, and, and these things will, won't, won't happen. The Bible, Paul says, you know, uh, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's pretty easy. We don't got to make it complicated. You know, you want to stop sinning? Well, stop sinning. Start going to church. Stop fellowshipping. You want to stop hanging around with that, that person where you are um, innocently flirting with? Stop doing it. And start, you know, hanging around with godly believers that will give you, keep you accountable. But what else do we see here? He doesn't just talk about lust. He, you know, it's interesting because this lust led to, to idolatry. And lust does lead to idolatry because when we put something, idolatry is putting something before God, replacing something for, for God. And he gives us the example here of, 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 of the Israelites when they, uh, with the golden calf there, when Moses took off for 40 days and 40 nights up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments from God. And Joshua went up with them, but he didn't go up all the way. <sighs> Finally, uh, during that time, the, the Israelites got antsy and they got, they, they got, um, you know, desperate, and, and they tell Aaron, because Moses left Aaron in charge for some reason, and Aaron probably is the worst leader. He gives, up, he gives the worst excuse. Anyways, um, they tell Aaron, okay, Aaron, make us some gods so we can worship them. And Aaron compromises there. Aaron says, okay, well, give me your, your, ear, your gold earrings and your ju gold jewelry. So he melts it, and he turns it into a golden calf. And he says, here is the God that took you out of the land of Egypt. So this is what he was trying to do. He was using some syncretism. And what that means is he was adding some truth with some lie there to appease the people. He's like, well, God is like a calf. He was probably thinking he's, he's gentle. He provides, you know, sustenance for his people. But he was forgetting that God is also a consuming fire and he does judge sin. And Moses showed them that when he came down. Usually when, when Moses came down from the mountain, being with God, spending time with God, he was, you know, he had that radiance. But I don't know, probably close to to the bottom of the foot of the mountain, he turned red, the Bible says. He was angry. He breaks the Ten Commandments, and he burn, burns that, uh, that idol, that golden calf, and uh, he makes them drink that. He makes them drink that, and then he stands up, and he says, okay, if you guys are with God, stand with me. If you that are not, well, they were killed. About 3,000 men died that day. And it, and it shows us an example here of what idolatry does to people. When they rose up to play, they weren't just, playing they were they were committing sexual sin as well in the old testament idolatry and sexual sin were very closely uh related interwoven there but then he talks about immorality same thing we're talking about now he says nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in and in one day twenty three thousand fell right there he's talking about the incident with balaam and his donkey remember that balaam and the donkey don god uses the donkey to tell balaam to stop to go back not to curse God's people. Well, he tried to curse them, and he couldn't curse them but bless them because they were still under the covering of God. Finally, he suggests to the Moabite king, he's like, bring out the women, and, and that worked. Unfortunately, the women lured out the men out of the camp, out of the, the place of blessing and protection, and they committed, idolat committed a sexual immorality with them, and idolatry came along with that. And you, that's when 23,000 people fell. There is no contradiction. There is another, I think it's numbers that says 24,000 fell, but 23,000 fell in one day. Altogether, it was probably 24,000. You know, and they fell because of the, this disease that the Lord brought upon them, this curse that the Lord brought upon them, because he was displeased with that. Today, we might not have this great curse when, when you sin automatically, 
But we have a great uh, disease as well that comes about be because of sexual immorality. You know, unfortunately, the consequences are, you know, a divorce, Ch uh, unwanted pregnancies, or people getting pregnant and not taking being responsible for take, you know having sex, uh, abortions, HIV, AIDS, STDs, uh, separations, and whatnot because people wanted to commit sexual immorality. We still see the consequences of sin today. And then he says in verse 9, Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. This is an interesting one. They, they, they were testing God. They were not just complaining, but they were grumbling and accusing God, actually questioning God's goodness. That's the same thing the serpent did with Eve. It's interesting because God used serpents here. And the serpent in the garden did the same thing with Eve. He, he made her question God's goodness. Hey, God is holding out on you. Are you sure? Did he really say that he, you can't eat of that? You know, of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And, and we see that. The Lord, the, Satan does that. He wants you to question the goodness of God. And, and right here, these guys were testing the Lord. When the Bible says, test the Lord and see that he, he, the Lord is good, it's not saying to test, test him like this. It's not saying to test his patience, to sin against him. And sometimes we, we can be like that today. We, we're like, Lord, I'm stuck in a rut. I'm here. Why do, why do you allow me to be here? Why do you allow me to have problems in my marriage? Why do you, why do you and so on, so many whys and so on? And, and we got to ask ourselves, you know, is God still good, even though my life might not be all that good right now? God is still good. God remains the same. God is always faithful, even when we're not. And you got to ask yourself, if, if you're in the desert and you can't get out of the desert, it's not because God is not faithful. It's because you lack faithfulness. Because I see that happen a lot. We stop going to church because things aren't going our way. We, we, we get mad at God and we complain at God. Like if somehow God is in the wrong here when it's us, it's, it's our lack of knowledge. It's our lack of understanding of how God works in our life. Now notice verse 10 here. It's similar to verse 9, but it's not so much it's sort of grumbling against, against God himself, but complaining. Complaining. This is a more common one with us. Usually most of my complaining is behind closed doors with my wife. I'll, you know, I'll vent with her and maybe she'll vent with me sometimes. It's mostly me. And I'll keep that at a minimal. But I think we all somehow, some way, at different degrees, complain. Hopefully not too much and hopefully not about other believers. Um, but see, what was happening here in verse 10, and commentators will disagree as far as what incident this is. Some believe this is the time when Korah and these two other young guys came and they were um, questioning the authority. They were coming up against God's anointed. They were coming up against Moses. They were uh, complaining here. And, and the earth opens up and it swallows them up and, and it eats them whole. The Lord prevented the first church split here by eating the people that started it from the ground. It's pretty interesting. Now, Paul doesn't want to give us a history lesson by just telling us all these stories. You know, this is not so much of a history lesson as much as it's, it's warnings, it, it's examples for us to learn from. Remember I told you at the beginning of the message what the word typos means, where we get our English word for type? Notice, look at verse 6 and 11. Paul says the same thing twice. These things are basically, they're examples. The word example here is, is the Greek word typos, which means to strike or to leave an impression on something or leave a mark. These examples that we've read already should strike a, a, our hearts, should give us an impression, should leave an impression so we don't do the same as they did. Our first point is this, avoid typos in your life. A typo is, is, is a mistake, is an error. We're all going to miss the mark every day. We all miss the mark every day. We come close. We, you know, we, we, we might come close, but we always come short. It's because of the grace of God. But the point here is these willful sin against God, just like these guys. These guys were privileged people, and they still sin, willfully sinned against the Lord. Those, those are the mistakes. Those are the typos I'm talking about here. These are the typos that the Lord is talking about that Paul is talking about. Avoid these mistakes and you learn from the mistakes that are already in the Bible. Mistakes, recorded mistakes of our other people because there are no mistakes in the Bible. But learn from them. Like I said before, it's the fool says, I'm going to learn from my own mistakes, but it's the wise man that learns from the mistakes of others. I have somebody, you know, I, I have somebody I love dearly and, and, you know, they're related to me. And, and she just turned 18 and she thinks she can do whatever she wants. And um, she, she says, I'm going to learn from my own mistakes. I'm going to learn from my own mistakes. I'm going to go ahead and do this, indulge in this over here and this over here, and then I'm just going to, when I binge off of it or whatever, when I get my fill, then I'm going to stop. But a lot of times that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. You know? 
you know, the Lord saved me from that, from, from being an alcoholic, a, a drug addict, drug dealer, gangbanger, and all that stuff. He saved me from that. But if, if I look at my old friends, it, uh, they're still over there. A lot of them, if they're not dead, they're, they're in jail, they're locked up. They're not, you know, they, they, were, they didn't all get saved. So it's wrong to think they're all just a phase. You know, a lot of people, even Christians say that. It's just a phase teenagers go through. No, if you're not careful, you're going to get stuck in there. Because sin does that to you. It's like mud. It'll get you stuck. You can't, you can't give it a two weeks notice. You got to just take off, repent, live it, give your life to Jesus. So we see these things, right? Avoid, avoid these sins. You know, what, what could they be? Maybe the, you have a golden calf. Maybe you have something that, that, that is uh, getting in the way of worshiping God. Maybe it's in, entertainment. Maybe it's your own, you know, my time, right? We have the my time. This is my time. I can't, you know, I can't go to church because this is my time. I got to do this over here. I got this hobby over here. Or maybe it's, uh, it's the love of money. And because of the love of money, you want to work, you want to be a workaholic. And you become a workaholic and you avoid what the Lord is calling you to do in your life. It could be any desire, anything that comes before you and God. So we got to be careful with idolatry, with complaining, with grumbling against the Lord. I remember um, some months back, there was a, a man that came here with his son. And he talked to me after church and he said that um, he, he was a... a, a he had left another church because of um, uh, there was problems there or whatnot. And, and he was coming to our church. And he was sort of complaining indirectly about the, the previous pastor and the previous church and whatnot. And, uh, and then his son, I don't know, his son could have been more than 12 years old. He was there in the conversation talking like, you know, we're just, just a big group of adults complaining about politics and complaining about a, 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 a thing about, I was like, all right, you know, whatever. A lot of complaining. And I was thinking, I was like, Man, I hope they find another church because uh, I'm gonna. They're gonna be trouble if they stay here. And um, and sometimes I ask the Lord, Lord, I wish I could read people's minds so I can just know if somebody's being genuine or if they're if they're lying or not. But then I start thinking. I was like, I'm glad I can't read your mind because I'd be hearing all these complaints at times. You know, we complain. I'm, you don't want to know what other people think about you. It's better for the Lord just to to handle that, especially when it's non nonsensical things. But, but really, the, the point is, don't, don't complain. Don't complain about The Bible says don't complain about anything. Our second point is this. Complaining arises from a lack of appreciation of what God has already given us. Do you see where that arose from with them? They didn't acknowledge that God was providing for them. They got tired of the manna. They had manna for breakfast, for, for lunch, and, and dinner. Manna every day. They got tired of, of, of the perfect meal here. It was manna pancakes, manna waffles, manna lattes, manna, man, manna, manna everything. And they got tired, and then they wanted meat, right? Remember that story? Give us meat. We want meat. Kind of like those old commercials, beef. Um, and you know what? God gave them what they wanted, and, and that did not fill them. I think there was even disease that came with that. Quail falls from the sky there. Uh, Psalm 106 talks about this. It says, and he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. Whatever it is that you think that you need to be satisfied in your life, whether it comes from another person or from a material thing, once you get it, it's not going to bring you satisfaction. It's going to bring leanness to your soul, okay? The only thing that can bring fullness to your life is Christ Jesus and that pursuit of God, okay? You got to pursue God. If you're unsatisfied with, with your life, or you go back to the gospel, okay? The, the way forward is to look back at the cross, to look back at what Christ has already done, right? It, it, it's, it's the filling of the Spirit, it's moving forward, not, not, not oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm unhappy because nobody called me for Thanksgiving. No, nobody loves me. Only God loves me. And that's true. God loves you, and that, that makes a whole difference. If God didn't give you a single thing from this day forward, he is still worthy of praise. He is still worthy uh, of honor, okay, because he has already died for your sins because you've already accepted him. He saved you, and he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. We might think, you know, we, we just got to count our blessings, guys. We got to count our blessings. Do you have a roof over your head? I, I can only apply this to myself. You got to apply it to your own selves. So for me, I'm, 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 I'm just blessed I have a roof over my head. I'm blessed I have a beautiful wife who, who is not a lazy wife. She does a lot of things. You know, she, she, she washes dishes. She cleans around the house. She puts up with me. She, uh, I got three beautiful kids, and, and, and they're great kids. They, they all love the Lord. The baby's 10 months old, but she still loves the Lord. You know, she's... I see her, I see she's starting to look at you guys while you're worshiping, you guys that raise your hand, and she's starting to do that. She sits in the, in the, in the background, you know, and, and, and focus on the blessings, not so much on, on, on the, 
the, the obstacles in your life or, or those things that you don't have and you wish you did have. You can be single or married and you can say, well, I wish I had this husband or I wish I, 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 you know, I had another spouse. I think somebody said that the worst thing, um, the worst thing than being single and wanting a husband or a spouse is being married and, and wanting a spouse, you know, because you once, you, once you're there, you can't get out of it as a believer. So, yeah, re be satisfied with what God has already given to you. But a lot of this uh, came about because of a lack of humility and entitlement attitude, and that's where we, we got to be careful. Just because you're privileged doesn't mean you're entitled. A lot, of, a lot of us mix that up. Just because I'm saved, I'm a child of God, doesn't mean I'm entitled to all these things. Remember, the Jesus way is humility. We must submit ourselves under Christ. We must come under the Lordship of Christ. So in our, the obstacles could be us. Our third point is, in order to get back under God, you need to get over yourself. You need to get over yourself if you want to get back under God. Okay? The Bible says, um, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's what, what the Lord is calling us to do, to be humble. You see, all of us have followed the Lord out of Egypt, but some of us are not following him into the promised land. And I'm not saying you're, if you believe in Christ here, you're going to go to hell. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying is you're not going to experience the fullness that God has for you in this life if you're so occupied with complaining or, or, or gossiping or committing uh, sins and are stuck in pornography or whatnot. You're not going to see God's hand of blessing in your life. You're going to be like the runner that hit the bench or the, like the person that Paul talks about that got to heaven, but the, they got to heaven as through fire, all their works burned up. You don't want to be that person that gets you know, to be face to face with the Lord and, and not show, you know, for the talents that he gave you while you were here on earth. You're not going to experience that if you choose to be occupied with yourself. Last verses here found in verses 12 to 13. Uh, we're going to look at the precaution Paul gives here. Let's read them together. It says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Those are pretty popular verses, not just verse 12, but verse 13 as well. I'm pretty sure you've heard them at least more than once before. Um, what Paul's trying to say right off the bat is that no temptation that you have is unique to yourself. Somebody else has already experienced it, including the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tes tested in all ways, tempted in all ways. Um, so sometimes we think, oh, Lord, I'm the only one that's going through this. Like uh, Elijah, remember Elijah? After he runs away from um, Jezebel, was it? Je runs away from Jezebel, and uh, he's running scared there. And, uh, and then he tells, Lord, Lord, I'm the only one serving you. I'm the only one that haven't, hasn't bowed the knee to, to Baal and whatnot. And God is like, no, there's thousands of more that haven't bowed their knee. But we think like that. We're like, nobody else is going through what I'm going through. You know? But it, a lot of people are. And we shouldn't think that we're unique and then try to allow that to be an excuse to, to binge on some sin or to complain against God because that's not how it goes. We have no excuse because Christ was also tempted in every way. And he can get us through the desert. This is our, our, our fourth point. God might, not, God might not get you out of the desert, but he'll provide the way to get you through it. Notice how this verse 13 says that there is a way out. Okay, But notice that you still have to bear under it. You still have to bear it. So it's not that God is just going to, God is like this Advil in the sky that as soon as you get a, a spiritual migraine, he's just going to lower, take it away, and he's going to take it away. Sometimes God wants you to stay in the valley so he can stretch you in the valley so he can use you on the mountaintop, okay? And I know you and I know me. I want to get out of the valley as soon as I can. I, want, I don't want to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I want to drive through it. I want to run out of the valley. I want to get airlifted from the valley into mountaintop or mountaintop. We all want that. But God uses the valleys in our lives to use us in the mountaintops. That's what God wants. He wants to teach you something in the wilderness so he can use you in, in the promised land. And so don't despise the days of small things. Don't despise the days, well, well, I, I want to be preaching or I want to be doing this and that. I want to be used by God. You can, you're being used by God in every situation. We're going to read. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Paul says later on, you know, in, in, in everything, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. In your workplace, in your marriage, you can serve God right there. You know, uh, building gates, welding, uh, speaking for or KYMA, you know, uh, uh, you, you're serving God there. So, so think about that as, as we continue here. We're, we'll finish with, with verse 12. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
that's a pretty powerful verse. That's a pretty powerful warning. Be careful lest you fall if you think you stand. Don't think you're so privileged that you got it under control. You might be thinking, well, Albert, you couldn't hang drinking, but I could hang. You know, I could hang and I could do this. I'm pretty, I got it under control. And then, then you find yourself falling again because of this proud, this loftiness of mind. You know, don't think you can stand lest you fall. Sometimes we, we think because we're walking with God that we're not going to stumble and we're not going to fall. This Thanksgiving, something pretty special happened to us. Um, it was a small, uh, small get-together. It was just my, my mom and my sister and my niece and my kids, you know. Well, my, my sister was recording uh, my daughter, the smallest, 10-month-old, and uh, she still um, couldn't walk. And then while she's recording her, she started walking. I think she sort of like, she likes the spotlight. And, um, and uh, she's like photogenic, I think that's the word. And um, she started recording. She was recording her already, and she starts walking to her mom. She takes like five or six steps, and it was like, wow, Thanksgiving. She's walking. What a grateful thing to be thankful for. But what happened afterwards um, wasn't so cool because uh, after everybody left, I'm throwing out the trash, and my wife is putting leftover turkey in the fridge. My daughter is, you know, just hanging around there around by my wife, and she's standing up holding on to things. And she tries to hold on to this towel. I think it was like a kitchen towel. And she grabs onto it, but there was no su support to it. So she falls with it, and she hurts herself, and she's crying. And if you're a parent, you know that's the worst feeling. And, and you know, I think God, when, when we get hurt, when we, when we try to uh, trust in something that is not him, when we try to put our, our trust in things that are not of him, we, uh, he also is hurt by us. I think God is heartbroken by, by the fact that you continually deliberately fall, that you deliberately not trust in him. So long story short, you know, just because you can walk doesn't mean you, you can't. Keep walking with God. Trust in Him, and He will lead you in the right direction. I want to go ahead and uh, give you an opportunity if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ uh, as the worship team is coming up here, uh, and the rest of you guys are bowing your heads. I know some of you guys like to peek. Please don't peek. Um, you know, maybe that's why nobody's raising their hands. Um, but I, but I, I want to make sure I give the gospel. I want to make sure I give the gospel every time to give the opportunity, whether somebody comes up or, or not, you know. I want to make sure you know that Christ loves you, that he died for your sins, that he's coming back again. I want you to know that he rose again on the third day and that he loves you. He died for your sins. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus and you want to accept him, you want to know that there's a purpose for your life, you want to get to heaven one day to that promised land that the Bible talks about, raise your hand and accept Jesus. I'm not asking you to come up here and, and, and walk up here in front of everybody, but you can do it where you're at. You can come as, you're all, as you are. If that's you this morning, raise your hand and I will lead you in prayer. Don't put it off. See one hand. If you want to uh, see two hands. Also, if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, maybe you've been like some of these Israelites that kept complaining, kept grumbling. You feel like you've stopped walking with the Lord and you want to repent now and, and start fresh, raise your hand as well. This is a, a call to you this morning. So I see two hands. I want, I want us all to pray with them and encourage them with this prayer. So repeat after me. Lord, I thank you for dying for my sins. I believe you rose on the third day. I believe you're sitting at the right hand of the Father. Lord, I repent of my sins today. Help me to follow you by the power of your Holy Spirit. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth and believe when, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And it might not feel like a whole flash of emotions and the sky opening up, but the Bible says that there is a party in heaven when one sinner repents, okay? So you might not see it now, but you're going to see it in your life. As you start walking with the Lord, God is going to change you because the Holy Spirit now lives in you. Praise you. Let's give, let's give him a hand. Amen. Let's stand together.